Welcome everybody to Too Legit to Crit, a tabletop role-playing podcast hosted by two guys who would consider the woes of a town in peril a them problem. Yeah, very much so. It's definitely a them problem. No, it's not an our problem. No, I mean, unless they're paying us, then it, now it's an our problem. Yeah, but even so, we've got the option to... Yeah, we've got the option to go, yeah, no. Yeah, it's a you problem. Yeah. yeah My we, name we is John Santana. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we wouldn't make good adventurers at all. <laughs> no, we really wouldn't. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm still Justin to follow on from the introductions. Yeah, the one that you actually stepped on. Oh. And now that you've kind of carried on, so I can't edit it out. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Production oh. woes, everybody. Yeah, I love it. Oh, so, yeah. Anyway, my man, how are you? I'm good. I'm. I've been... Reading lots of, of new rule book because obviously uh, somebody was very, very kind and left me a copy of the Fabula Ultima uh, rule book. So I've been flicking through that because it's awesome and I love it. Um, and then, yeah, just just relaxing a little bit. How about yourself? Well, I mean, I haven't been doing too much this week. Obviously, we played Fabula we on Thursday, which on was Thursday. absolutely great. Mm. Um, but I've been very busy, and yesterday I think everything kind of caught up to me. So I just had to knock my Sunday game on the head. Ah, just to do, kind give of have a that break. Yeah, just yeah. give myself that tiny, tiny little bit of a break, mm. so I could have all my energy to come here and record for you and for Aww, our listeners. And bless you. See how I spun that? That was great. This was good. Wizards of the Coast should hire me. <laughs> I mean, speaking of hiring, uh, uh? that I mean, to be fair, I did kind of set you up you on did, that. One. You said that off, and then I, I knocked it down. But there you are did, some, there was... are some jobs going with uh, Medifius. There are, there are. I, I saw that earlier today. <laughs> um, what you were saying you were looking at? Yeah, I was tempted. I was tempted. It was. Uh, <laughs> it was a PR manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, yeah, I th- hey, I think I'd be a great PR manager. I mean, yes. And no. <laughs> I think I'd be fucking great. You do realise that if I go to, if I actually apply for this job, I'm not going to be able to use this as a reference. Because this is not. where you're absolutely, absolutely going to slate me. Yes, because, I mean, one of the key things that they've put is I have an excellent knowledge of the tabletop hobby, including role-playing games, board games, and war games. Now... The only way that you'd be able to prove that to them would be to point them to this, <laughs> which would both say, show that you do have, you know, a love of the hobby, but also that neither of us have any knowledge of it whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, but I don't necessarily need to point them to here. I can just, I can just point them to my digital library and just kind of go, look, I got books. <laughs> What books do you have? Yes. <laughs> and I and I would just happen to have the Modifius books up first. They'd be like, oh, look, it's Fallout. Oh, wow, look. So uh, how did that get uh, there? How did all of these books that you guys produced happen to end up here? Oh, so, I mean, no. let, me, let me just move all these Modifius books out of <laughs> the way. Oh, there we go. There's some Pathfinder. But let's focus on the Modifius ones. <laughs> Fallout and... Oh. I can't remember the other one. I- that's it. <laughs> but they have also got uh, oh, a, a customer, customer service assistant. So that's, you know, a pretty entry level job for anybody who wanted to get into the the field. Uh, to be honest, my customer service is spectacular. I can, really. I can agree. That, that is true. You, you know, hate I- people, but you hide it very well when you're being paid. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm like a whore. <laughs> I, Maybe not I, what you should be saying. <laughs> I mean, I can give you the girlfriend experience. <laughs> like, I mean, one hundred percent. I can. Oh, applications no, are now no. closed for that role. I'm sorry. Ah oh, man, but I think I'd probably do better at the PR management thing <laughs> because you know, I I think my brutal honesty might might help and hinder at the same time. Yes, you know, here here's where you would fall down. Be approachable, diplomatic, and tactful. I mean, I can be tactful when you I'm getting one paid. one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> and that is diplomatic. 
But, okay, I mean, I guess I could be tactful. <laughs> Sometimes. You know. I mean, at last, Wizards of the Coast should have hired me to do their PR shit. Well, you see, no, this is where you fall into a, into another one of the issues of what they're asking for. Actively solve problems instead of parting blame. <laughs> yeah, but I mean... Another finger point. <laughs> yeah, but then if it's our fault, I'm happy to point our finger, like the finger in our direction, just kind of go, true, true, yeah, true. we fucked up. <laughs> that whole whole OGL thing. Yeah, we fucked up. <laughs> it wasn't Hasbro, no. No, it wasn't Hasbro. It was us, because we were trying to suck up to Hasbro. You know, so, you know, I think I'd do that pretty well. Yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> no, no, I, I, th- I think I would smash an interview. Oh, oh that would be quite funny. I mean, Although, to be honest... I feel like it would limit what we can say, though, because I would... There would there would be times where I, I, I have to say negative things and you'd be like, well, well hang on now. <laughs> Let's not say negative things about Modifius, <laughs> who are indirectly sponsoring us. <laughs> who are indirectly paying for half of our bills. <laughs> you know, who are helping me buy new equipment in order <laughs> in order oh. to do this and hosting from ACAST and whatnot. <laughs> No, no, so, yeah, we'd have to be a bit more careful, I'm guessing. No, 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 you would. <laughs> you see, that's where the balance would lie. <laughs> you know, Cause I, I could... I, I would have to just, like, take a full 180 in the opposite direction of anything you say in the interest of balance. <laughs> yeah, that is true. You, you, I mean, we, we have to kind of balance each other out. <laughs> I think my hostility towards 5e has grown since we started doing this podcast. I, I would agree. I would agree. It's funny, though, so... <laughs> At least I find it funny. I mean, well, the, the, I, there is a system coming out, though, to change the subject completely, that <laughs> I am beyond excited for. And I think you know which one I'm talking about. I've got a, I've got a vague idea. Diablo. Mm, I was actually going to go the other one, because you, you were excited about it the last time we mentioned it. I, I was. But I have been playing Diablo as a video game since Diablo 1 came out, back when I was a wee nipper. And I've played every version of the game apart from Diablo Immortal, because we don't talk about Diablo Immortal. It was the mobile phone version of the game. We don't talk about it. Um, right, okay. So, because, you know, you're talking to somebody who's got no fucking clue <laughs> it was, whatsoever. Basically, when they announced Diablo Immortal, they, they, they pulled a, uh, a wizard's um, and they, they monumentally fucked it up um, when everyone got all upset because we were expecting a Diablo 4 announcement and then they're like, here's the mobile game. And everyone just kind of went like, what? And their response was, what, don't you guys have phones? Like, that's kind of not the point, my guy. But anyway, I digress. A tabletop role-playing can we, game. Yeah, can we talk more about that? Because I feel like there's... <laughs> Like some anger, and no, that's always it's, really it's, good for our that audiences. Anger, that anger has long gone. Um, I ranted about it many, many times on my streams over on Twitch when it happened. So it's beyond. It's it's in the past. I've put it behind me. Um, so was it any good though? Well, immortal. Yeah. No. So <laughs> what? It's terrible. So, but I mean, because obviously Diablo has got as, and as far as I'm aware, quite a a characteristic sort of style yes because you know there are diablo like games sort yes. of thing so i yeah, imagine the that there is a view and everything like yeah. yeah yeah very so very was diablo so was the mobile game like that no it was like every other mobile game that exists you know like, so when, like you, when you control with like a on-screen analog stick and like four but like it was terrible it was, it was shocking um but tabletop role-playing game set in the Diablo world uh, and it's going to be a completely new system so it's not going to be like a you know 5e but Diablo or Pathfinder but Diablo like no 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 they are trying to bring the mechanics of the video game to a tabletop role-playing game Um, they've got a survey on the website for it so it's glass cannon unplugged who are doing this alongside genuine entertainment and blizzard um on their their website they've got a survey 
where you can give them information about, you know, how long you've played Diablo, which Diablos you've played, what, like, you know, like three words that describe the Diablo universe to you. Basically, they're trying to gauge what Diablo players and TTRPG players and that crossover, what they would want to see. Um, so they're actually, like, not just creating this thing that's going to be awesome. They're also trying to get that input really early on from the people that are going to be playing it, which is really cool. So as far as I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Diablo is quite heavily action orientated. It is. Isn't very, it? So it's, it's a it's lot of... It's an RPG, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of, like, for want of a better way of putting it, hack and slash. Yes. Right? That, that so, is the best way to put it, if I'm completely honest. So uh, you would <laughs> definitely need, I mean, you would need a very quick combat mechanic. Yes. I mean, because you wouldn't be able to do something like 5e combat mechanics or no, cause it's Pathfinder. Very clunky. Um, and, Pathfinder's a bit too limiting. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be very intrigued to see how they do it because they have put on on the page for it um, fight against multiple opponents at once and satisfying fast-paced combat. So they are trying to capture that hack and slash element of the game. See, I'm struggling to figure out how they would do that because Same. you've got I mean, because you've got things like um, Powered by the Apocalypse, mm-hmm. where it's very, it's not a case of blow by blow. It's a case of you essentially roll a dice to get an idea of how a, how a particular combat goes. Mm-hmm. But would that be too sort of abstract? I think so. For people who would like to play Diablo? I, th- I think then so. You've, but then you've got the other sort of side of the coin, where it which gets would be too involved. Yeah, but like for example, a Delta Green, where mm-hmm. each round is one action. Yeah, but because it's one action, it goes, it moves really quickly. I, I guess it depends on how they define those actions out, right? Because one of the the things with Diablo that makes it so hack and slash and everything like that is very few of the skills are single target. Right, most of them mm. will hit multiple targets, and um, the the character builds play a big part in it. So, like which like uh, talent trees you go down and stuff like that. So, it, it's going to be really interesting to see how they capture all of that into character creation as well, um, because that is a huge part of the game. Right, one well, like one class can have five or six different viable builds, um, which I guess would be the same sort of thing as like an archetype in like your standard TTRPGs. You've got your subclass or archetype or, you know, whatever that particular system wants to call it. So it's going to be really, really interesting. I'm going to be definitely keeping a, an eye on it. Um, I've already signed up for notifications um, involving both the TTRPG and the board game because um, they are producing both a board game and a TTRPG. There will be components and accessories that will be shared between the two as well. So if you have one, you'll have stuff to use in the other. And if you have the other, you'll have stuff to use in that. But I'm also guessing that you don't need both because they're coming out a year apart. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, the tabletop role-playing game should be uh, getting a crowdfunding campaign in 2024. Um, and the board game will be in fall of 2025. Fair enough. I mean, I'm, I'll be interested to see what they do with it, especially that, that combat mechanic. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be an interesting thing to see. That's going to be the important thing to capture. If they can capture the combat well, the rest will be pretty straightforward. I think it's going to be that combat. All right, well, we'll keep an eye on it. So let's talk about the other one that you may be excited for. Oh, you're going to have to be a little bit more specific than that. Well, there was, because the last time we mentioned it, it was Deathmatch Island. Yeah, it was. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so that has had one hell of a backing holy shit i'm looking at it now yeah Fuck. It, <laughs> they had a goal of thirty thousand uh us dollars um with eight days left so you can still back it unless it's eight days after release of this episode um 
they are currently sitting at $128,644. So they have smashed their goal. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's outstanding. Um, uh, yeah, by the looks of their stretch goals, like there's some really cool stuff as well. I don't know if you've had a look through them. I haven't really looked at the stretch goals now. So um, they've got a oh, so many things. Um, the one that was the coolest one that I saw. Just trying to find it again. Um, where is it? Uh, ah, one that we're approaching is um, New Islands. So they're going to create multiple islands and maps for the islands and stuff in full. Okay. So they're going to. So they've already created two new islands from the stretch goals. They've got two more, um, it's like stretch goals for for new islands that may may obviously get hit in the next eight days. Um, I, I reckon we'll probably definitely hit one of them because one of them is only about a grand and a half away. Um. Whether they hit the last one, I don't know. But it's, yeah, it looks awesome. It does, because it, it is like the... Because there's a lot of movies mm -hmm. that have that sort of uh, premise. Yeah, and we also have video games as well. You've got things like... I mean, the, there was a whole bat Battle Royale like video game boom recently, right? With like Fortnite and PUBG and COD had one. Uh, was it Warzone? Um, like even, even Counter-Strike had a bat Battle Royale game mode nobody plays it but but they had it <laughs> um and yeah it's it's a huge huge thing to tap into yeah this was the one that had the 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 following mechanic didn't it yes that you you kind of garner a following as you play yes which i think is fucking phenomenal i think yeah that's yeah I, I think so as well um I'm I'm excited for it, and I'm just looking at the uh, the prices for the pledge levels, and it's really reasonably priced. Well, fifteen dollars gets you the PDF, thirty gets you the roll twenty stuff as well, um, and the PDF. So thirty dollars. Also, if you don't do roll twenty, you get the hardcover and the PDF, which is a pretty good price. Um, Forty five gets you the limited edition and the PDF. And then you get into like the retail and then the survival survival kit, which looks awesome. Yeah, it does. It does look quite interesting. There is an actual play mm. on there, which I will probably be watching. Yeah. Later on. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of see how the rules sort of play out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'll definitely be interested in, in watching that. So. I'm going to add that to my YouTube watch list. <laughs> but yeah, that is something that I will uh, probably be backing before those eight days are up because I think it looks awesome. Fair enough. But like just kind of taking a bit of a segue mm -hmm. here, a bit of an unexpected one, but something cropped up on my threads feed the other day about something else that we looked at previously. Oh. Um, there, where there has been a bit of a development and that is The Last Caravan. Oh. So the last caravan um was a it was a, an RPG that was kind of based on Little Miss Sunshine meets The Last of Us. Yes. So you are basically taking a road trip in this post-apocalyptic world. And that just that premise alone really you know, really kind of uh, interested me. And someone on threads posted an image that they'd done for it, mm. which was fucking beautiful. It was like a, a War of the Worlds-esque alien okay. sort of thing. Let me see if I can actually get... Let's see if I can actually save the image for that and send it to you. Because it is really fucking glorious. But anyway, I'll I'll send that to you later on. Yeah, no, yeah, that'd, be, that'd be cool. But I'm yeah, so they through and it's, it looks awesome, man. I mean, it looked awesome the first time we looked at it, but it still looks awesome now. It does. So it is actually available for pre-order now. It is, yes. So that is another one that I'm I'm interested in definitely. But yeah, sorry, because that just when we we're talking about Death March Island, I, I remembered seeing this on Threads. Mm. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely, I think maybe we should, um, it maybe in an upcoming episode, have a, have a little uh, scroll through of our past content and do, do maybe a, a bit of a where are they now episode. True. Um, but, I mean, there are a couple, or at least there is one, that we won't have to do that on because no. we can talk about it right now. Yes, we can. Um, so, Invisible Sun. Yes. The Monty Cook. Um, project black where they cube. were they were re-releasing the black cube yes um okay so i think the last time we spoke about it it hadn't gone to kickstarter yet it had not it has now and it has smashed its goal <laughs> smashed its goal but it's still 150 fucking dollars i mean yes but it's also they they had a goal of a hundred thousand and they've raised three hundred and eighty four thousand six hundred and forty six. Yeah, that's not. It's not something I'm willing to invest in. Me neither, because that is a lot of money um, for something that it. Don't get me wrong; it looks incredible. Um, it's just not. It's not me. It does look incredible, but to me, I it just seems too much. Like a board game. Yeah. It has, you know, because it's all about items and we give you this and these cards and these tokens. Yeah. Like, mm, Yeah, roughly a thousand cards. Um, yeah. Just Sooth deck, a game board. And I, I think that's the, the bit that makes it seem a lot like a board game is that you actually get a board game. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> what kind of gets me is... Monty Cook's sort of um, sort of campaign for this, right? Because mm-hmm. this has cropped up on Facebook multiple times. I keep seeing adverts for it. And in nine out of ten adverts I see, it's like, because it's £30 of stuff, that is not a fucking selling point for me. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, you, don't you want to carry around £30 of stuff to go play board games with your friends? No! <laughs> As somebody who has a lot of board games, I absolutely do. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I carry around probably a lot more than that when I go and run my tabletop role-playing games. Yeah. But yeah, this this for me just doesn't really grab me, to be fair. That's fair. I mean, like I say, it, it's not one that I'm going to be investing in. It does look awesome, um, but I think it's just it's not one for us. No, I mean, just kind of reading it over, I just, I'm struggling to find any sort of um, information as to what the system is about, mm. other than, oh, it's weird. Well, yeah. Fair enough, it's weird, and it's big, <laughs> and it's heavy, but that isn't enough for me. Yeah, no, that's fair. But for anybody out there who is interested, um, yeah, the, the backer kit is live. There's 11 days left as of recording. Yep, so crowdfunding, it started on October the 31st. Mm-hmm. Ends on the so, 18th. So yeah, I'm just having a look at the pledges now, because I think I think the cheapest one was the 150 quid one. Uh, no, there's one for 45. All right, okay. But that's for if you possess the black cube already, and you just want the um, extra... There's a, there's a new book, basically. So you, you get the extra book for 45. Oh, wait a minute. So you've got access to the new sphere. Yeah. Which I think is just the books uh, in PDF the books. form. Yeah, without the all of the, so the stuff. To actually get the black cube. It's $252. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. Or for... Wait... Oh, that's for retailers. Never mind. I was very confused there. I was like, for 377, you get the cube and the book for 45, but then I realized you get three of the cube. Yeah. This is for retailers. Right. That makes more sense. <laughs> I mean, uh, to be fair, I do know a retailer. <laughs> but still. Yeah, that is, uh, it is a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. I mean, even, even in board game circles, 200 and something is, is a lot of money. Um. I mean, because how much, how much is, um, like, Frosthaven? No idea. 
Um, I mean, because that, that's a substantial board, board game. I've got, well, because I've, I've got quite a few like substantial board games. I'm just having a look now at them. Um, I mean, you've, you've seen my pile of board games when you come around here on Thursdays. I have, yes. Um, I think the, the, the dearest one I've got is probably about 70 quid. Um, <laughs> but I have played one that was 150 quid. Um, it was a board game called Crossmasters, I think it was called. Wasn't right. right. It was uh, some somebody else that I know bought it and we used to play it a lot. Um, but that came with a whole bunch of like resin, like minis that were like all really nicely painted and all that sort of thing. Um, and it was a really cool game. And the it was all like the board was also like a big, like big chunky board that you had to like maneuver around on. And it actually was all... Um, needed for the game it wasn't just like yeah oh, these are cool to have like it was actually the mechanics of the game was re- revolved around it um so that was that was a really cool game but that and that was absolutely worth 150 um that we paid for it back when we paid for it but well i mean i'm looking at gloomhaven now it's about 140 quid yeah and Frosthaven's a bit more expensive because i think it's out of print so yeah. obviously that's gone up but even but you know they they're the most expensive board games I know of. Hmm. I, I'm sure there are more expensive oh, ones yeah. than that. Oh, there absolutely but, is. Yeah, but I'm not a board game person, so nope. I won't have a clue. Frosthaven, <laughs> 250 quid from Forbidden Planet. Yeah, that sounds about right. Hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I ain't buying that. Yeah, no, me neither. But it does look awesome. Yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks very pretty. It does. Hmm. It does indeed. All right. So another thing that is coming out soon, Yarp. which I'm sure you're going to be excited about, Yarp. is the the D and D, or should I say, Wizards of the Coast channel? Uh, no, it's Hasbro's channel. It's not Wizards of the Coast. Hasbro's new D and D Fast channel. Yep. The, the new Fast channel called Dungeons and Dragons Adventures uh, launches in about two weeks' time. You'll be able to get access by Amazon Freebie, so I should be already yep. have it. And Plex. It will launch three new series, Faster Purple Worm, Kill Kill, 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 The Forgotten Realms Adventurers, and The Cooking Show Heroes Feast. That's the one I'm looking forward to the most, if I'm honest. <laughs> well, I mean, Faster, word, faster Purple Worm, Kill Kill. I think that's uh, Matthew Lillard that's doing that. Oh, really? Mm, as far as I'm aware, and oh, that'll be cool. Some of the glass cannon lot are going to be on it at some point. That'll be pretty cool. So yeah, I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to bother with it, but it is it is something that's upcoming for all you wizards of the coast refuge. I mean fans. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm most, like I said, I'm mostly looking forward to the the cooking show Heroes Feast because if they are cooking stuff from the Heroes Feast book. That'll be pretty cool. Um, so uh, I'm sure you've seen the Heroes Feast book because it, it was on my bookshelf, but it was uh, it wasn't mine. It was um, Chris's um, that he left here. It's basically a a cookbook for recipes within the D and D world, like the Five E world, uh, but using obviously our world equivalents to two things to create these dishes. Um, so it'd be pretty cool to see them being like. Like I, I've done a few of them in my kitchen. It'll be really cool to see like actual chefs doing it rather than just you know some dickhead in the, in his kitchen. Um, which, granted, that's what they are as well. They're just more qualified dickheads in the in a kitchen. Yeah, they're they're dickheads who get paid to be in a kitchen. Ex- exactly. Um, you're a, you're a dickhead who doesn't get paid to be in a kitchen. No, I'm, I'm a dickhead who pays other people to be in a kitchen. <laughs> but then you've got Gordon Ramsay, who's a dickhead who gets paid to be in a kitchen. Calling being other people dickhead. dickheads, yes, yeah, and being a dickhead. It's my dream. So it's like a dickheadception. <laughs> it's my dream job. <laughs> but just to be able to call people dickheads, <laughs> just to stand in the kitchen and just slag people off for being dickheads. It's like, how dare you do your job? Fuck you. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd be good at that job. You would. <laughs> You'd be I think I, at it. <laughs> I think that if if that if that was an actual job, just to. Stand somewhere and abuse people. Just, just stand and bray people. Actually, I'm, like the, you say that like you didn't do that when you used to work behind the bar. <laughs> depends which bar. <laughs> yeah, no, there were certain bars where I had to be a bit more professional. There were other bars where where I could get. Well, to be honest, 
I only berated people who deserved it. Exactly. That's all. That's what Gordon Ramsay does. He berates people who deserve it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I remember. I whistled at somebody who wasn't paying attention. <laughs> so he turned round and went, "Did you just whistle at me like a dog?" I went, "No, mate. No." He ordered his drink. He paid his money. I went, "Good boy," and walked off. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> it was oh. fucking amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I'd be amazing at that job. You would. You would. Do you know what else you would be amazing at? What is that? Well, y- you you originate from a certain uh, geographical location, correct? I do indeed. And that geographical location is famous for having something that nobody expects. <laughs> I'm listening. I'm listening. Well, how about we take that thing that nobody expects and we add aliens? I'm, I'm definitely on board. <laughs> so for those of you that haven't figured it out, we're talking about the Spanish Inquisition. So, so can, can you pronounce the name of it? I really, nope. want to, I really want to hear you pronounce it. Nope. Not even Come on, give it. it. Nope. Give it a whirl. I, I defer to my Spanish-speaking uh, co- co-host. I mean, if there was something in Afrikaans, I'd, I'd try it. That's fine, because Af- Afrikaans people don't care if you mispronounce things. I, I had a long relationship with somebody where if I mispronounced something, she took the piss out of me for the next two months. So I'm no, not I would, doing it on I would the recording. never. You I absolutely wouldn't. would, because I would pronounce <laughs> this, and it would be the short that you put out every week as well. So no, you pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> You already know I'm going to put out a shot of me asking you to pronounce it, and yeah, you it refuse it. No. <laughs> All right, so it's called Negocios Infernales. That. <laughs> that, that, that. And it is a tabletop role-playing game that uses a custom deck of uncanny and evocative cards to create characters, establish relationships, and inspire role-play. Mm. And you would love this because, Justin... It's, it's cards. There are no dice. I know. I'm so happy. Um, so apparently it's a hilarious and macabre fantasy game. You mm. play wizards in the court of Reina Resoluta who have bargained with devils who are really aliens, but the wizards don't know that. For magic powers, your wizards use their magic to solve a problem of national or even planetary importance or fail uproariously in the attempt. <laughs> I feel like we need this in our lives. I do, and, and here's why. No dice, no GM, no prep, all fun. So it's like the, one of those perfect things, and that, that's not me saying that, by the way, guys. That is the, 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 the quote direct from their Kickstarter, just to clarify. But that's like the kind of thing that, you know, you guys get somewhere to set up for a game and maybe, you know, somebody's running late and you don't want to start until they get there, but you don't want to have just, you know, something that you could just pull this out. Yeah, I feel like we need this in our lives. We do. We absolutely do. The game is set in a spalla. <laughs> Which I fucking love. Oh, um, at the bit where, where they've got the pledge levels instead of pledge levels, it's just the chapter that says "Take my money." Really? It's that. <laughs> and it's the finest pledge levels. Where are we? Oh, oh the, <laughs> there the, it is. On the left hand side. Take my money. There's my pledge levels. <laughs> All right, so five dollars a holographic sticker. Nice card. Okay, forty five quid. We get the game. That's not a bad price. So we get 200... Over 270 cards. So it's going to be like 272. <laughs> my my main gripe is the postage is going to be an arse. Um, possibly. You can get a virtual deck for a dollar. Yeah, but I mean, I feel like uh, this is the sort of thing where you need the actual, um, the actual uh, physical. It's way for you to draw cards from the deck of destiny. Ooh. So yeah, it's a, it's a web web based version web based version for a dollar. Where the fuck are you seeing that? It's on the right hand side, available rewards. Ha! Huh. <laughs> right at the top of available rewards. To a web based way for you to draw cards from the deck of destiny, right? Wait. Yeah, but that does that that doesn't include the rules, does it? No. So that is literally just the deck. Yeah. Uh, ship All right, so in the world. ships to anywhere in the world. But I'm having a look at shipping now. Mm. Um, so ten to fifteen for thingy, twenty to forty for the rest of the world. That's not too bad. Hmm. 
I'm intrigued. I'm interested. Because you get the starter set, you get the secret virtual deck as well, and you get all stretch goals for that $45, which is £37. <sighs> £37. That's not bad, dude. That's not bad. Wait, what do you get for everything? Yeah, that's it, because I saw the everything as well. Yeah, it's £53. You get the starter set, the sticker, the postcard set, the pin, the virtual deck, all stretch goals, and obviously the, the game. Oh, I'm very interesting now. Yeah, it's very tempting. It does look awesome, though. It does. It does look awesome. It does, just looks like that. Like you said, this, the sort of thing where we could just... Yeah, we're well, bored. Like somebody cancels last minute or, you know, whatever. They just, just whack this out. Try and, you know, thwart some evil plan to destroy the planet and hold these aliens that we don't know are aliens. Uh, right, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna move off this because that is, backlist is, is project your call, is your wallet calling out that, to you. Yeah, my wallet is basically dry humping my leg at this point. <laughs> it's like no Christmas I, I, I is around the corner. I'll what? tell you what. I'll go halves on it with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Frick. <laughs> anyway, we'll discuss it later. <laughs> we'll discuss it later. We've got four days to go. We've got four days. We'll discuss it later. Um, speaking of aliens. Aliens, yes. Aliens. aliens. Obviously, we mentioned earlier that you were around here on Thursday. I was. I, I we, was we played some around your house. You were. We played some more and Fabula. We were playing some more Fabula. And Edgar finally got to meet Potato. <laughs> And everybody got to meet Edgar, which you met a previous version. I did. <laughs> you met you met a one shot version of Edgar. Yes. And this and time around, you met your what, version. My version of Edgar. What did you think to my version of Edgar? I liked him. <laughs> <laughs> I do find it hilarious, though, that like skill wise, you and Chris are almost clones. <laughs> Yeah, we were kind of looking at it, and I think there's there's very little difference between <laughs> between our characters. Um, I think I think that because his one of his classes is different to one of mine, but everything else is almost carbon copy. <laughs> so obviously that that will diverge now. Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, and I mean, well, we gained a level as well. We did. So, we did. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I decided that, you know, I kind of like these, these people, so I'm going to start trying to protect them, which is why I took a, a level into Guardian, so I can protect people. Well, I'm not going to tell you why I took a level in. Oh, you're mean. Because I'm going to leave it until we play Fair enough. this Thursday. Yes, because we are playing again on Thursday. But, but it was yeah, really fun. It was. It was a really fun session. Again... Mm. We got to see a bit more of the system. Yes. Where in the one shot, it was very... I mean, we got... The one shot gives you enough. Oh, absolutely. But there are sort of little idiosyncrasies that aren't included. So in this, we got to see them. We got to try them out. We got to yep. try out, um, like, contested roles, which we'd never done. Yep. And it's still, it's still a great system. It is. It is. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And... I love as well the the flexibility with um, like your character progression because it, it just seems so fluid, um, and it encourages like multiclassing because you can only take like a certain amount of levels in a class, right? But yeah, so the you can level take cap is so much higher. Yeah, so um, it goes from level five to level fifty, and you can take a maximum of ten levels. In a particular class. Mm -hmm. So by the end, at level 50, you will be five classes. At You'll least. be a combination of these classes. And it really works well. Um, because like you say, Chris and I were very similar. Mm -hmm. But that's Possible. entry level. That's yeah. how we've started. We will diverge. Mm. And the level I have taken has been due to the game on Thursday. Yeah, well, I mean, that's why I took mine as well. Because yeah. I, I was going to go a different route, um, but then after 
after the the session and with what happened in it um you know seeing because up until now like pote has been a very uh on his own kind of guy because he's you know traveling trying to find somewhere to to set up a bee farm um <laughs> it's best motivation for any character i've ever had <laughs> no it's a, it is a solid motivation <laughs> Um, so he's been very like, uh, on his own for a lot of it and seeing the way that you guys were like protecting each other in the combat kind of inspired him to go, huh, that's, that's, you know, really cool that these guys are all looking out for each other and stuff like that. And he kind of wants to do that. No. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't really want to inform no, what yeah, no, I've no, chosen, no, but I look forward to finding it, out on Thursday. It was, um, due to the game. Mm. You know, we played the game and after that, it just got me thinking. So I got in touch with Couch and just went, here's what I'm thinking. Mm. You know, due to things that happened, due to my interactions with uh, with the rest of the party and stuff like that. And how I'd kind of um, envisioned Edgar and kind of what I brought to the table, mm-hmm. which I think was a bit of a surprise for some of you. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't the uh, the paperwork heavy Edgar from the one shot, but I, I wasn't expecting that, to be fair. I mean, I still kept um, the paperwork you thing. Did, you did. I think it was because I think it, it kind of became a bit of a, a meme in the one shot, um, you know, because it, 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 I think because it was, it was quite funny and, and all that. Like we obviously we took it to the extreme during the one shot, right? Um, so I think the the way you still had it, but it was more not dialed back. That's that's the wrong. I suppose not yet dialed back because it wasn't dialed up to like a hundred like it was during the one shot, but it was still there. I like that. Yeah, and it, what I wanted to do was provide a justification for it. Mm. So rather than just me being a dick. <laughs> Um, I wanted to kind of have a in-character reason mm. to be able to present to the rest of the party for them to kind of go, oh, shit, well, it does actually kind of make sense. Yeah. And it, it, <laughs> Sorry, carry on. carry on. No, it was just like the beginning where it's like, okay, so I need everybody's names, where you come from, and your next of kin. <laughs> That's the bit I was going to bring up. That and, someone, and someone just went, Oh, none of your business. I went, it's to, kn- it's to know where I send your body when you yeah. die. <laughs> that bit, it, it killed me inside. Oh. So, oh, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so just for, for the people listening, when we first played the one shot, I was being my usual dickish self with the character. And, you know, it, it was more of a comedy sort of character. Yeah. It was more more done for laughs than yeah. than any substance. But obviously now it's a campaign. I have kind of refocused him, and I think he is still funny, but in a oh, yeah. very serious very way. different way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He is very serious and yeah. very. I won't say aggressive, but nasty in a way. <laughs> Um, I, I would say it's more, he, he doesn't like to dick around, right? He wants to just get to the point and carry on. There's like, that, that's, at least that's the way it came across to me is it was more like he, he had a goal in mind and he just wanted to get to the goal and he didn't want to fucking take eight years to get somewhere that he could do in five minutes. Yeah. And that's the kind of. I mean, because I was talking to Chris about it and no, sorry, talk, this, uh, talking to Couch about it. Mm. And I kind of envisioned like your, your Dr. Cox character. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not necessarily a bad person, but at the same time, it's just not, a v- shit. not a very nice person. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, and that's kind of wanted, what I wanted to, <laughs> to, to come across. And I think I did. <laughs> Oh, it was really good. I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, and we had a, a, a an encounter with 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 an alien, uh, or as far as we know, an, an alien. Yeah, and that was a, clearly this is far too big for your encounter. Yeah. So like, okay, so we're just gonna but listen too to big you. For Grim. 
and turn around and walk away and yes we're going to get you at some point <laughs> we'll get you later <laughs> it's just not going to be today <laughs> but yeah it was it was a ton of fun it was and it's kind of made me look more into the system and yeah i've got my level up ready for thursday i've already done mine cool i wonder what everyone else is going to do yeah i'm intrigued to find out um and you know we it should give us something to talk about next week. Yeah, but speaking of things to talk about, yeah. Um, last week we dealt with a question. We did. Um, regarding monsters and what not. We did. And we did tell people, well, ask people, should I say, yep. to you know put in a comment in our Facebook mm-hmm. group about what their favourite monsters were. And there was, somewhere... We did get a response. We got a response, and I got another one today. Oh, um, lovely. Which I'll ask you about. Okay. So the one I got today was from someone who mentioned a type of orc that explodes. Yeah. Yeah, talk to us about that. Yeah. So this, this is from Chris's campaign. Uh, back when back when I was in that, um, we we got to this like fort settlement thing, um, and we you know we set up a, a little spot for us to sleep in the courtyard of it, and it was everyone was kind of chilling around. They had like a big bonfire in the center. It was kind of like a communal gathering point for the fort. Uh, so everyone's you know sitting there eating, drinking, having a good time uh, when this caravan came tearing through the front gate and they tried to slam the gate closed behind it um, and obviously failed. Uh, And then very quickly, the whole place was kind of overrun by orcs. Now us being big, strong adventurers, we're like, orcs, we could deal with this. So we walked over and we started hitting them because I was a barbarian and that's what barbarians do. We go go over and hit things. Go over, start hitting them, uh, kill one, and then I get asked to make a constitution saving throw. And I was like, uh, do what? So I made a constitution saving throw. I passed, luckily. Um, but the other orcs around me did, didn't, didn't pass. And then one of them exploded. And I had to make another constitution saving throw and then there was a kind of a chain reaction of orcs exploding um and it didn't didn't end well <laughs> we all survived just about <laughs> yeah well that, I mean, that sounds like what so what's this creature called do you know no idea um because <laughs> to be fair he did tell me i asked him to put it in the chat in yeah. the Facebook group, yeah, yeah, and he hasn't done so. Yeah, no, I, I can't remember um, exactly what they were called. Uh, all I remember is that if you failed the Constitution saving throw, you would be poisoned, um, and basically you couldn't be healed until you'd taken a long rest to kind of get over the poison. Um, so, like, you couldn't be like magically healed or take a potion or anything like that. You were just until you took a big long rest, you were basically buggered. Um, and it was, it was terrifying. It was very, very scary. (laughs) I mean, especially as a barbarian, right? My whole job is to be in, in the thick of it, but being in the thick of it means I've got to subject myself to multiple explosions in a round because we kill one and that sets off kind of a chain reaction through all of them. It does sound like a fun creature, to be honest. It was. It was a lot of fun. Um, I can imagine on on that side of the screen is a lot of fun. Player side of the screen, it's terrifying. (laughs) Yeah, I don't care about the player side of the screen. (laughs) But no, it was awesome. Um, Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun though. But yeah, I I can't remember exactly what creature was. It was some some variation of of orc. Um, I'm going to try Google exploding orcs and see what goes. That's literally what I'm typing in right now. Um. Oh, that's it. The the Yurtus. 
Although Google kind of auto-corrected to explode in Orca, and I yes, really want to go down that rabbit hole. Let's not do that while we're recording. Let's, that's a different different time and place rabbit hole, that one. Oh, that's just like whale carcasses exploding. Oh, that's no fun. No. Um, but yeah, awesome, awesome creature. Um, and definitely a lot of fun. All right. Okay, so yeah, I mean, there's there's one, but there are um, Couch actually offered us a few options. He did. So his favorite as a GM is an Etta Cap, mm-hmm. um, a fun low level monster that, when used right, has a massive area of control and group management skills. Favorite as a PC, I always love hearing the stories of the giant encounters that happen. Um, his favorite being fire giants. Mm. Um, worst monsters to GM. Uh, is a basilisk. Yeah. I don't know if I agree there. I, I I do for what he, the reasoning behind it. There's, there's just so much um, to keep track of. And like he says, the, the party ends up kind of just shelled up and just not looking at it. So it, it kind of gets a bit stale very quickly. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I've ever used one in second edition. Mm. Um, I'm just having a quick look now. See what but, it is. But his worst monster is a PC. I honestly forgot about them. Rust monsters. Ah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I get rust monsters. Um, I can get how annoying they are, but I think that that again, so because the Basilisks, for example, I have run one of these in second mm. edition. They're not that bad, to be fair. Mm. Um, they are actually quite streamlined. So I think a lot of these are system dependent. Yeah, possibly. And I think the Rust Monster is system dependent as well. Rust Monster. Because I else. think in first edition, it was, yeah, they were terrifying. Mm. In second edition Pathfinder, not so much. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot more sort of chance of walking away with your meta. Metal items. Um, I think as well, it also, like, Rust Monsters, the reason I didn't really think of Rust Monsters when we discussed this um, last time is because a lot of the classes I play don't use a lot of metal. Hmm. So a Rust Monster, to me, isn't an issue. Um, because, obviously, the, the main thing is that they can rust non-magical metal. Right. Yeah. Um. So, being like a, a like a druid or any kind of spellcaster, we don't overly use metal. And same for like rogues. I mean, the only thing would really be my daggers. But daggers are a dime a dozen in pretty much any fantasy world. Um. So you, you're always going to come across you know daggers and and whatnot. Um. And the armor and stuff that we wear is leather. Um, or hides and stuff like that. So that, again, not really metal. Um, and obviously, couch being being the party cleric, clad head to toe in lovely metal armor, with his lovely metal scimitar because of you know his deity Saran Wrap. Um, I can understand why rust monsters would be a particular hell for him. <laughs> Yeah, I've just looked up the difference between a Rust Monster in 1st edition mm. Pathfinder versus the 2nd edition. Mm-hmm. And yeah, in 1st edition, their Rust ability, um, if they attack you, you get a reflex save. Mm-hmm. If you fail, it takes the object down to half its maximum hit point hit points and gain, it gains the broken condition, a second hit destroys the item. Uh, so I, I, I'm looking at the, the 5e version for obvious mm. reasons. Yeah. Um, very, very similar. Um, so the rust monster corrodes a non-magical ferrous metal object that can see within five feet of it. If the object isn't being worn or carried, the touch destroys a one foot cube of it. If the object is being worn or carried by a creature, the creature can make a DC 11 dexterity saving throw to avoid the rust monster's touch. If the object touched is either metal armor or a metal shield being worn or carried, it takes a permanent and cumulative negative one penalty to the AC. 
Armor reduced to an AC of 10, or a shield that drops to a plus zero bonus is destroyed. So the Pathfinder first edition one is fucking harsh then. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, sure. like in the second edition, it, you just do damage. And yeah. once you get to a certain amount of damage, then it's broken, it's destroyed. Yeah, but same, this same one, in, 5e. in Pathfinder first edition, a second hit destroys the item. Yeah, that's... So yeah, again, I can see why that would be particular trauma for that is, fu- that is rough <laughs> <laughs> funny as fuck but rough. especially like if, if you're a heavily armored uh you know combatant you're going to be in the front line as well right <laughs> yes but yeah he had saran wrap to protect him <laughs> oh that's a question would saran wrap around his armor protect him from the rust monster <laughs> I don't see why not. Because it, it can't touch the armor if it's wrapped in Exactly. If it's wrapped in sur- There you go, couch. Saran Sur-ra- wrap. Saran wrap. <laughs> That's your answer. There you go. Boom. Fucking problem sorted. Solved. Next. There you go. Problem solved. Yeah, let's answer some fucking questions. Let's do it. We're on let's a roll. It. We're on a roll. So let's head over to the couch. While, while, well, let's roll over to the couch because we're on a roll. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll see myself out. Because um, I've got a couple of questions. And so do I. I have exactly two questions. Same here. Um, okay, and mine are from Couch. So one of mine is from Couch. Ooh, betrayal. Um, and one is from Sci-Fi. I've got one from Sci-Fi that kind of follows on from some of his questions from last week. Okay. Um, so obviously he was the one that gave us the uh, most and least favorite monster question. Yeah. This time, uh, Sci-Fi, who is back from sunny Spain, and he made it through the storm, asks us, "What is your most and least favorite class?" I think most favorite. F- well, for me, I think you know it. I do. I, you I know, do know it. So it's going to be Bard. Yeah. I am so surprised by this turn of events. I did not see this coming. <laughs> I play a good bard. You do. You do play a good bard. I play an arsehole of a bard, but... I think the real question for you, then, is what is your least favourite class? I think for me... And this is kind of a bit um, hypothetical, because I haven't played that many classes yeah but i think for me it would have to be something like fighter or barbarian okay i've always seen them and i know in second edition they've got a lot more shit they can do yeah uh but in first edition which is probably where i i was a bit more exposed to them and Mm -hmm. they were very like one trick yeah and I just found that incredibly boring. Mm-hmm. I think in, in later editions of Pathfinder, in probably like in 5e, there's a lot more that they can do, which is absolutely fine. But I've always kind of got that stigma. Yeah. No, I, 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 yeah. I get that. Makes sense. Um, yeah, I think as well, like it, it's because they are, they are quite a, a basic class. And I'm not saying that, Negative, because I actually quite like fighters and barbarians and all that sort of thing. Um, I think it it maybe lends itself a bit more to, rather than having all these in-depth mechanics to make them interesting, you've got to make them interesting in other ways, um, which I quite like, because it, it was a way for me anyway to try and branch out my storytelling a bit more, um, because it wasn't... I didn't have to have a reason for why I carry this weapon instead of that weapon or, you know, whereas with like sorcerers, you could always say like, there was, you could always say, Oh, this, he, he, this wizard doesn't use fire spells because, you know, his family died in a fire or something like you can come up with some bullshit as to why he doesn't use that type of spell. Um, hmm. But with like a martial character, like there's no reason for them not to just use a great ax because it's the hardest hitting weapon. Right. Yeah. Because so you'd have to come up with a flavor reason for it. So you, I I found that they were really good for for me in particular because as you know, the storytelling element is where I always struggled. Um, it was great for me because it encouraged me to 
dive into the story side of why this instead of that a bit more than I would have to with other classes. I mean, I also think Pathfinder First Edition did have the sort of problem where you were almost forced to optimize. Yeah. Um, because if not, you'd be you'd be you'd be behind the rest of your party. Well, Case, case so, in point, um, your Skulls and Shackles campaign, the the grappler I made, I don't know if you remember her. <laughs> yeah, I remember her. She was useless because to in order for the the enemies that we were, and I mean, it didn't help that I rolled like shit, but in order for the enemies to be a, a challenge for some of the other players in the group who had optimized, it outscaled what she could do because she wasn't optimized. I built her for, for flavor and a bit of fun, right? Um, and I think that was that was always a problem that, and it was part of the reason I think I moved away from Pathfinder in the first place. Yeah, and I know these things have been fixed in Second Edition, yeah. so you can still optimize, but the, uh, at the same time, it's not as punishing. Yeah. If you don't, you can still have a good, effective character by playing whatever you want to play, and it's going to be even. I think they've even tweaked it a tiny bit more in the remaster that's coming out in a couple of weeks. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think I've always kind of got that that preconceived notion of fighters and barbarians mm-hmm. just being a rinse repeat sort of class. Yeah. Whereas in in newer systems that isn't the case. So mm. I'd definitely have to try them out. But yeah, yeah. Bard one hundred percent my favourite. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> all my bards have been memorable. Now, here's, here's the question. What do you think my favorite class is? Because <laughs> it's a tricky one. I'm a, I think it's going to be a blind guess for me, to be honest. I'm going to go ahead and say Warlock. Ooh, I do like a Warlock. They are up there for me. But no, not my favorite class. Um, I like Warlocks because of the whole concept of, like, you have this other there's other entity that you have to answer to, which I quite like. Um, especially if you like work with your DM to, to make that um, like an actual thing. Right. Cause I, I feel that with warlocks, a lot of, um, a lot of people don't play on that um, deal that you've made. Right. Cause you have, you've made a deal with, with some, some entity. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of, and it's same for clerics as well, I guess. Um, not, although clerics people are a bit more on it about um, it, it tends to be forgotten that you have got this other entity that is has its own motivations that you need to align with otherwise they can just no more powers I mean that's something that that happened in regards to the witch in Pathfinder 2nd edition yeah because they have a similar sort of thing you create you strike a deal with an entity mm. and they grant you your powers etc etc but other than that that's kind of where it ended for the witch however in the remaster they've made that a mechanical presence as well yeah. so i think that is probably the the issue with these things um but in the Pathfinder 2nd edition remaster they've definitely made the witch's patron mm. a lot more of a mechanical presence. So I think that's another thing I'm kind of looking forward to. Mm. That'll be good. But my favorite class, Monk. Monk was going to be my second choice. <laughs> I do love a Monk and I hate that they are just so behind. Like it, They're one of those classes that are so behind the curve that even when they get really, really strong later on, they're still so far behind the curve that it's just not mechanically worth playing them. The only reason to play them would be for for the fun of playing them, um, which is it's, it's a bit bit frustrating. And that's why I'm hoping that in the new new version of D anD D, they fix that properly. So that is my hope. But my least favorite. It's going to be a Cl- controversial one. I would have said cleric. No, I don't mind clerics. Fair enough. My least favorite is paladins. Not because of the class, but because of how everybody plays them. I mean, the alignment re- restriction for paladins was a bitch. Yeah. And I think it's also the way that like people um, with like 
when they're playing a paladin, they tend to go very, well, this is the law. You can't break the law. Like that's, that's not what they're about. Like, especially in, in 5e anyway, like depending you know, on what your, your oath is. You know, you've just quoted a prodigy song. Yeah, I mean, I did. I, I can not get it out of my head right now. <laughs> well, that's what you get for playing prodigy to your child. Uh- <laughs> hey, he said he liked big beats. I know. Um- and I was very proud. <laughs> But anyway, back to Paladins. <laughs> yeah, so, so. <laughs> like, um, in, in 5e, the, there's a lot of different, like, Paladin oaths and stuff like that. And, like, one of them is, um, like, Oath of Vengeance, where their entire motivation for what they're doing is to get some, get, get vengeance for something that happened in their past. Essentially, Batman. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, basically. Now, I would not say that Batman follows the law. <laughs> No, I think he skirts it slightly. Oh, Maybe he goes so as far as he skirts it. I would say he straight up breaks the law. He goes out in the it on occasion and stretches. he beats the shit out of people. Stretches it on occasion. Yeah, <laughs> but then like you'd ha- you, I, I, I've had it in in games where there's been an oath of vengeance paladin who comes face to face with like the gang that in his own backstory he's written in this gang that killed his whole like village. He comes face to face with them. And he says, nope, we need to turn these people in because that's the law. It's like, dude, that's not what your oath is. Like, no. And I just think that people maybe misunderstand the class or something, but I don't know. I just, I don't like the way that people play them in general. Um, So that's why Paladins are my least favorite. No, that's fair enough. Um, And I think you are right. I think where alignment was such a heavy sort of... um, requirement for paladins yeah i think people would kind of choose like between the lawful and the good side of things yeah i mean case in point there was a there is a it's no longer canon anymore um but there is a city in galarian which basically had legalized a certain trade Mm mm-hmm so the paladin in the party was kind of stuck. Yeah. Because, yeah, this is fucking wrong. But it's legal. But it's legal. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's putting an unnecessary burden on the player. Yeah. Um. Obviously, again, I'm sorry to hark on about it. It's, it's during a week and a bit's time, but it's something that the fucking remaster has finally done away with that bullshit mechanic. Yeah. And hopefully people can actually play Paladins properly. Hopefully, and then they won't be my least favourite class. Then yeah, I'll have to where, find a new class to hate. Where there is an <laughs> ideal, and they follow that ideal, and they stick to that ideal. Yeah. And in your case, like in the example that you it, mentioned... It's their, their oaths. The, the Oath of Vengeance Paladin, mm-hmm. they're there to get revenge. Yeah, essentially Batman. Somebody broke the law and hurt me when I was younger, so now I am vengeful against anyone who breaks the law. That's fine. But to do that, you're going to have to break the law. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I think, yeah, it's just, yeah. Hopefully the the changes to... um, Alignment and that filter out from from two E as well. I, I don't personally use alignment in my games anyway. Um, even if there is like an alignment criteria, I find a way around that. Um, so I don't really use it in in my games because even even things like good and evil, it's perspective. Yeah, I mean, the only reason I've ever used alignment is if someone's done something so fucking outlandish, and you've kind of gone, dude, seriously. I need yeah. to, you know, th- there needs to be a, there needs to be repercussions for this, for fuck's yeah. sake. You know, if if they've gone completely off the rails, you know, and it's like, yeah, I can't allow that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's the only time I've actually ever enforced alignment. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm, I'm glad it's going and should be already gone. Yes. But, yeah, that was a good question. I enjoyed that. Thank mm. you very much, Sci-Fi. So I've got a question from the namesake of this particular segment. Yep. Um, Couch, who's writing for writing to us from a little slice of home, the Asphoris branch. 
<laughs> so what are your thoughts on split adventures? The idea of taking your party on two different adventures with two different GMs. Much like John ran the adventure with multiple groups on one scenario, this would be one group running multiple scenarios through different parts. What are your thoughts? Because I do have thoughts on this. I think it's quite interesting. Um, I think the issue would be itemization and stuff like that, because if one GM gives them an item, how does that affect the other game if it's the same characters? Um, are they are the events happening simultaneously, or is it one's happening after the other or before the other, but you're just running them at the same time? Like that but, would be the. But I'm not seeing it as in uh, one party running multiple scenarios. I'm I'm seeing it as one group, so they can be using different characters. Then I'm fine with it because that's what oh, that's what I'm doing at my table. Um, mm. I'm running my pirate campaign, and somebody else at the table is running one of the the five e books. So we've got different characters, but the same group of players. But are they the same overall campaign? No. Are they in the same world? Yes. Because I oh, they're in the same world. Yeah. I tried doing this in you know after you left Skulls and Shackles, the game mm-hmm. kind of split. So there was one part which we carried on playing Skulls and Shackles. And then the other part where I basically took Couch and Chris on a jaunt around the different planes and <laughs> all these different things. And yeah. I had this idea and I approached Scott, who was our original GM yes. when we first started playing. When we first got into it. And I basically said, look, how about if you... Were if we were to bring back our original characters, but into my campaign, mm. and they would diverge. Mm-hmm. You'd run your thing with our characters, mm. and then I would run my thing with the rest of the table. But the stories would be intertwined. Mm. And it, we started it. it. Actually, it actually started, but then Scott, due to um, like personal um, obligations, had to drop out. Yeah. But we actually started running it, and it was a really, really cool concept because I wrote the the start point. Yeah. For how these characters would get introduced, and then I basically handed it over to Scott and kind of went. This is the direction that I would need you to kind of go in, but whatever mm. happens is entirely up to you. Yeah. So we kind of did it, and it was it was fun, but again, you know, personal, yeah, uh, course, personal yeah. obligations, and we just never got to see it through. But yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. I think that would be a lot of fun. I think the like like I said, the, the hardest part would be making sure that they do run. Um, alongside each other, so that there there isn't like um, there, there's no diversion at some point that kind of means that they will never meet and never sort of intertwine or or, or that sort of thing. Because otherwise, you are just running two separate games, right? Yeah, I mean, one thing would have to have a knock on effect. Exactly. And I think, um, so th- you would need to have a, a very high level of commun- communication between the two DMs to make sure that that happens um yeah i think, I think it's a really cool idea i think it is possible oh yeah it's definitely possible i think it would just it would be there would need to be some kind a, a very high level of communication or alternatively if like with with what my my group's doing where it is technically taking place in the same world um but not it at the same place yeah. So they are technically separate stories, but they do start, you know, they originate from the same point and, and kind of go out from there. It would be possible at some point to bring them back together. That wouldn't be the end. Like, you know, it wouldn't be an impossible thing to do. Um, Here's an idea. Mm-hmm. All right. So one GM yeah. running two different tables. Yeah. Like, and different groups, not only different, different yes. characters, different people. I entirely. think I'm going with this. 
one of them, they have their story, but then you kind of angle the other one. You basically pit them against each other. Yes. So essentially, I have you've got to do this for so long. <laughs> you've got one table, and you don't. It doesn't have to be like one's an evil, one's not. But no, they're just no. basically on two opposite sides. Yes. So essentially, the, the the way that I thought of doing exactly what you're talking about now, because I have seriously considered it and I started writing it, but mm. I was like, I'm never going to get. I can I can barely get one table. I'm never going to get two tables. Right. Yeah. It was essentially. Um, a bit like a, a civil war type scenario. Yeah, exactly. So you've got two warring factions and essentially both parties, no, no particular side is evil. It's not like, you know, one of the factions is doing something really evil and the other faction disagrees and now they're at war. It's just a case of these guys have these policies. These guys have those policies and both of them want to be in charge. Right. Um, and then essentially, yeah, you have one group of adventurers, uh, adventurers that are doing jobs and bounties and stuff for faction A, and then your other table is doing jobs for faction B. And at certain points, you will put them on the same task, but the other one would have already done it. So when they get there, ah, oh, that bit's missing because uh, another group have already found it. And you, you kind of, you can bounce those off as well, depending on um, like clocks because like, like you've said in the past right you you like to run things on a on a clock in your game so like this is happening no matter what they do so if they start going off and looking after the goblin infestation in that town instead of going on the job that they were sent on and the other party goes straight to the job well they're going to get the relic first right you know what would be fucking good for that yeah blades in the dark it would it would be really good because you that. basically you create <laughs> two gangs yeah. Essentially, one yeah. gang doesn't need to know that the other one is actual people playing it. Yeah, it's they just need the, to. They just need to know. The oh, PC gangs. Yeah. When. Yeah. Okay. So what? This gang has gained territory. Yeah. And then on the other table, you kind of. Oh yeah. Now this gang has gained territory. Yeah. And just. Oh, that would be fucking phenomenal, dude. And like, as you get more and more tables, your entire like city becomes no NPCs. It's all just different tables. Being in rival gangs against each other. <laughs> if I ever win the lottery and I don't have to work and That's can spend <laughs> a stupid fucking amount of time uh, on this, then yeah, th that is one hundred percent what I'm doing. That would be so fun. But yeah, that was a good question. Yeah, I like that one. That was a good one. Mm. So I also have a question from the segment's namesake. You tramp. <laughs> You um, hussy. Well, to be fair, it's because um, he's asking this question from the location of the Isle of Vegetable, uh, Vegetable Isle Isle. Fair enough. Where he's negotiating a new contract for the um, little slice of home franchises. <laughs> so this is all fabula related, guys. So just... Yep. Uh, <laughs> so, as most fantasy is based in... Um, Wait, what? I, I'm, I think he's missing a word here, but essentially he's asking how scientific would you allow your players to get or how scientific would you go? Because um, it, it, it looks like there's a word missing. Um, so, for example, the player who collects all the real-life ingredients to build TNT through shops and cavern systems, etc., would you let them build TNT? Um how would you handle sort of somebody trying to put science into your game? Yeah, I wouldn't like 100% um, just because at the end of the day, these are games, mm. you know, they're not meant to emulate life. Um, Pathfinder first edition certainly gave that a fucking go and it just <laughs> became bloated and it became, yeah. and it kind of, it kind of, um, fueled this this sort of player's mentality where it's oh if I can imagine it then I'm going to have to be allowed it mm. yeah whereas at some point you've got to kind of go no yeah at the end of the day this is a game there are rules there are mechanics in place and you need to work with the mechanics in place and if you mm. start kind of trying to to game that then you're just kind of ruining the fun, to be honest. Yeah. I think for me, um, it would depend on what they were trying to do. 
So if it's something that is already much easier to do with stuff that exists in the world, like with the TNT example, right? I mean, what, what do you use TNT for? Exploding stuff. Well, is there an easier way to explode stuff than going through the long, arduous effort of trying to invent TNT? Well, yeah, you can just cast Fireball. But, like, for example, in, in I don't know about 5e, but in mm. Pathfinder, there is a crafting mechanic. Mm-hmm. No, there is in so 5e as well. So, any item you get, you can technically craft. Yeah. So, there is a way in-game to actually do this. Yeah. So, but if you start going, oh, well, I've got this, I've got that, can I make it? It's like, well, no, because these rules are in place for the sake of balance. Yeah. The moment you go outside of that, you are breaking that balance. Yeah. I think as well, like, it it would also, if it's something that's not going to affect, um, like, the the story that you've got and the, the whole campaign setting as a whole, I'd probably be a bit more lenient with it. But if it is something like they're, you know, they're developing a nuclear warhead, no, fuck off, you know? Um, even things like developing TNT, like, sure, I'll let you try, but TNT is a hell of an unstable substance, so there's a chance you're rolling a new character. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I wouldn't feel... I won't feel massively <laughs> comfortable if doing anything that is outside of of the pre-established way of doing things. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, it's because these things are in place to maintain a certain level of balance. Yeah. And we just can't forget at the end of the day, these are fucking games. Yeah. That's my logic anyway. No, that's fair enough. Yeah. So All right. ho- hopefully that answers that one. All right. <laughs> Okay, so the last question again from mm-hmm. from Couch, who is surviving the Pemble catastrophe, <laughs> is most systems let you do what you want in terms of storytelling. With multiple layers of dimensions and space above your players, how far reaching would you be happy to go? How far would you push your story to be that complex? And which systems would you find best for it in your experience? Um Okay, so Systems, I'm going to be very biased because the only system I've ever written games for is 5e. Um, So I'm going to be very biased on that. I'm going to say that out the gate. Um, Are there better systems out there for what I run? Absolutely. Do I know them? No. Uh, (laughs) So I I tend to write everything in 5e just because it's a system I'm comfortable with. How far would I go? It depends on what the story needs. if the story can take place entirely within the material realm, then that's where it's going to take place. I'm not going to force like shoehorn in. Oh, you're going to the, this plane of existence because I think it's a really cool plane. And I want to send you guys there. Like, I'm not going to shoehorn in that for the sake of it. Like if it makes sense for the story, then sure I'll do it. Um, or if they, for whatever reason, decide that they want to go there, then I'm not going to stop them. Um, unless it's an absolutely stupid idea and they shouldn't do it, um, then I will have NPCs that are very clearly saying that's a stupid idea and you shouldn't do that. Um, like going to the, I think the Earth plane. So it's the uh, it's the plane of existence where all Earth elementals uh, originate. It's just solid Earth. There is no, there is nothing there. It's just Earth. So if you were to go there, you would just be encased in Earth and suffocate immediately. Um, so not a good idea uh, <laughs> I do believe that is a settings thing as well because it is yeah you know in, in the Pathfinder setting the earth plane is what you said but there are little pockets mm. where you can actually have a full blown civilization yeah I mean again you know that's that's one of the great things as you know, as he said in the question, with all of these games, is nothing is set in stone. If you want to have a civilization, a civilization that's hidden somewhere on the Earth plane, you absolutely can do that. Um, but it's it's one of those things where I guess I guess what I'm saying is, unless it makes sense, I'm not going to do it. I'm I, yeah, I'm on the contrary. <laughs> I like playing with all the toys in the toy box. I know you do. And if I see something that's fun. It's like, fuck yeah, we're doing that. 
I will make up a reason. I will find a reason that that will get them to where they need to go. You know, in the in this homebrew I'm running, they had a jump through hell because I thought, fuck, that's going to be fun. <laughs> so I basically came up with a scenario where they fall through a, a portal to hell. Mm. And it's the same with, with creatures. If there's a creature I want to use, I'm going to make up a fucking reason as to why that creature's there. <laughs> I think after this current homebrew is over, I will have played with a lot of the toys in the toy box, so I can actually start to dial back my campaigns a tiny bit. What's been your favourite toy in the toy box so far? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> I think the Tarask. Yeah? Yeah. I've never used a Tarask before, and um, the the starting point for this homebrew campaign Mm. was that the city that the party were in was fucking decimated by a Tarask attack. Mm. And now they are heading back to face it. Oh, okay. So there is going to be... I am going to be playing with the Tarask soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh. very much looking forward to that. I, I look forward to hearing about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, I'm going all out. <laughs> so yeah i mean that that has probably been one of the funnest things i've done mm. um yeah the john through hell was was good but i think it was very tiresome mm. because it was just constant it was a john through hell that's what yeah, it was meant what it should to be. be yeah um what else have i played with oh yog sagoth fuck me that was fun <laughs> Yeah, I've done, um, I did the, what else did I do? Oh, what's it called? Fuck. Something Hydra. It's a classic D&D monster. Where it makes people forget shit. Oh, um. Uh, oh God. This yeah. is how good that monster is. We've both forgotten its name. Yeah, it is a D&D mod. It is a classic D&D um, module. False Hydra. False Hydra. I did that. Nice. That was fucking amazing. Nice. One of the characters just found a piece of paper in her pocket and it said, mm. run. <laughs> in, in her handwriting. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, oh. the false Hydra. God, that mm. was fun. So yeah, I'll see something and kind of go, oh, I need to implement that. And then I'll find a way to do so. Fair enough. But I think that's about it for questions. I would agree. And I, I think, think that's about yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's about all we've got time for. Yeah. Um, thank you to Couch and Sci-Fi for mm -hmm. sending in questions. They were fantastic. Um, thank you to you, Justin, for spending some time with me this evening. You're very welcome. Do you want to tell people where they can find you on Tinterwebs? Of course. Uh, you lovely folks can find me pretty much everywhere at Just An Accurate TV. Um, I also occasionally stream video games and stuff over at uh, on Twitch at Just An Accurate TV there as well. Well, as for me, you can find me on Mastodon at Natural Juan. You can also go to our link tree, which is Linktree. Um, forward slash too legit to crit and you can find all the other places where you can interact with us mm -hmm. we have um, a blue sky account an instagram account a threads account a fucking tiktok um yeah we're, we're basically everywhere at this point we've even and got a, and facebook of course we've even got a discord where i kind of jump on from time to time mm -hmm. uh, you're welcome to jump on with us and just chill out and hang out um and also, if you like what you hear, don't um, please like leave a review, um, leave us a rating and just help us grow. And most importantly, thank you to everyone who's taken time out of, their, out of their busy day to listen to two idiots waffle on about tabletop role playing games. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>